Hey, it's Paul Masetta. And if you are struggling to persuade other people and want to know why, then sit down and stay tuned because in this video, I'm going to reveal the 10 things that nobody else is telling you as to why you absolutely suck at persuading others. Okay, so before we get started, I want to make something absolutely perfectly clear. What I'm going to teach you has to do with something called street smarts. Now, when I tell people about influence and persuasion, I tell them that I basically got three educations when it came to learning effective communication and more specifically how to influence and persuade other people. The very first education that I got, which at the time I didn't realize was an education, was during my childhood. Growing up on the streets of Brooklyn, you get an education really quick in effective communication. Why? Because you learn how to deal with bullies, you learn how to deal with wise asses, you learn how to take a joke, you learn how to give a joke, you learn how to be quick on your feet, you learn how to develop wit, you learn how to develop a sense of humor, you learn how to deal with bullying, you learn how to deal with adverse type of situations. Now, if you grow up in a nice, warm, cozy, secluded little neighborhood with a beautiful childhood, unfortunately, there are some things that are gonna hold you back. There are some ways that that's gonna hold you back in the real world when it comes to effective communication. That's just my experience. The second education that I got was when I was 18 years old and I graduated from high school and I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I knew everything I didn't wanna do with my life. I didn't want to be an average Joe. I didn't want to work a nine to five. I didn't want to be fighting with my uh, co-employees about who gets to take off Christmas vacation, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so at 18 years old, I had to get a job. So I took a job in sales on Wall Street and it was there I got my second education. I worked in a commission-based job. Most of the jobs I ever had were commission-based. And I learned very quickly in a shark infested world where everybody's fighting for that same piece of the fish, what works and what does not work. When you're surrounded by a hundred wolves all fighting to get a piece of the same carcass, you quickly learn what, and, and your paycheck depends upon it by the way, you quickly learn what works and what doesn't work when it comes to selling, influencing, persuading, pitching other people. And then the third education that I got was when I got into the business of actually teaching this stuff to other people. Because what I wanted to find was how to merge all of the academic stuff when it comes to influence and persuasion versus like what works in the street. And so the stuff that I share with you is from a concept called street persuasion where I blend those two things together. And here's the reality. Persuasion Effective communication, influence, persuasion is both a science and an art. The science part, that's all the academic stuff. That's all the behavioral stuff. That's anything you could learn in a book about psychology, right? That's actually the easy part because that part's like math. Two plus two equals four, always has, always will. The hard part is the art part. That's the stuff where you got to figure out when to use certain techniques and strategies, how to read people, how to deal with certain people. That stuff is a lot more trickier and that's the stuff that I don't hear anybody else talking about. And so that's the kind of stuff that I want to share with you specifically today, which is in my opinion, probably the reason why you're not doing well when it comes to influencing and persuading other people. So what I've learned in the past 20 years of studying this stuff in the past 10 years teaching it are these 10 lessons of street persuasion that I want to share with you today. And if you're missing the mark on any one of these, you will most likely suck at persuading other people. I don't care how much you know about psychology. If you don't understand street smarts and what works in the real world, it's not going to work for you. I could give you an example. Take a highly decorated psychologist, a, a doctor of, a, of the brain, who knows everything there is about human behavior. You put him in an environment where his paycheck or his ego depends on his ability to influence and persuade other people. You put that guy in a boardroom surrounded by 100 sharks, he's going to get eaten alive, okay? Because he doesn't understand the street smart 
aspect of it. And that's what I want to share with you today, these 10 lessons. Lesson number one is that most masters of persuasion are born, okay? There it is. It's out there. I said it. It's the truth, okay? I know it might sound a little hypocritical coming from a guy who teaches people influence and persuasion skills, but the reality is most of the people that are really good at influence and persuasion were born that way. They are naturally born charismatic extrovert people. They understand how to read people. They have, they have, they exude confidence. They understand how to hold themselves in social situations. They have a naturally good sense of humor. This is stuff that can't be taught to other people. Okay. And that's the vast majority of people that are masterful at persuasion. If you lack all of those things, I am sorry to tell you, I'm here to tell you straight out, go find something else to focus your energy on. Pick up gaming, pick up playing chess, pick up something that doesn't involve you communicating with other people, okay? The good news is, lesson number two is that persuasion is a skill. So here's the caveat to what I just said. If you do have some sort of a foundation, no matter how small it may be, if you have a good sense of humor, or if you intuitively know what people are thinking, or if you're charismatic, or if you're confident, or if you know how to carry yourself in social situations, if you have one of those things to start with, then you can build on your skill set and become extremely good at influencing and persuading other people. So a little bit of a caveat there. The majority of them are naturally born persuaders, but if you got something to start with, just like anything else in life, you can work harder and become almost, if not just as good as the people that were born that way. Lesson number three is that some people cannot be persuaded. So every book, training, course, seminar, um, thought leader out there, myself included, we all talk about how to persuade this one, how to persuade that one, how to persuade in this situation. But the reality is some people just can't be persuaded. And it's your job to figure that out as early as possible so that you don't waste your time with those people. There are some contexts or circumstances that make it impossible for somebody to say yes. I go over them in a different YouTube video, but for today, I'll give you two examples. So example number one is you got the finest locally sourced grass-fed beef that money can buy, but you're trying to sell it to a vegan. They're never going to buy it. They don't have the same harmonic world view on this topic that you do. It is impossible to persuade that person to say yes. Second situation is the person doesn't have the ability to say yes. Now you might think, well, uh, you know, Paul, that's common sense. I wouldn't try to persuade somebody that doesn't have the ability to say yes, but you'd be surprised at how many times that actually happens. How many times you're in a situation, maybe it's a sales presentation where you got a lot riding on the deal. You got to close this deal. Maybe it's the deal that gets you your bonus or that makes your mortgage payment or, you know, or, or gives you a promotion. And you're so focused on getting the deal that you forgot to ask if the person is the actual decision maker. And so that's a, a, another type of common situation where some people just cannot be persuaded and you're wasting your time, money, money, energy, and resources trying to get them to say yes when they just cannot say yes. Lesson number four, and this is a big one. Some people are not worth persuading. And this is again, something that I don't really hear anybody else talk about. Some people are just not worth persuading, okay? I can tell you personally that I have certain customers that when I see an order come in from that person, I almost want to cancel it and refund it right away because this is the person that's going to email me 20 million times asking me questions about a product that they paid $7 for about an ebook that they bought that costs $7. What's this guy going to do when he buys something that costs $97? He's going to torture my life. He's probably going to wind up asking for a refund anyway, or he'll probably just do a chargeback. Even worse, he'll just call his bank and say, oh, I didn't want this. Can you cancel it? And then I get hit with a chargeback. That person's not worth persuading. 
okay? You ever had a friend that the minute you do them a favor, bang, they got a favor to ask you for a right back? Or if they don't ask you for it right back, it's like they write it down on a piece of paper and they stick it in their back pocket and they hold on to that favor and they can't wait for the opportunity to remind you that they did you that favor so that they can get a favor back from you. Those people were not worth persuading to begin with to ask for that favor. Better off leaving them alone. Lesson number five, some people need to be persuaded the hard way. So. I talk about this concept of likability in my other videos, something I took from Tony Robbins that made a lot of sense to me as soon as I heard it. And what Tony said was that we tend to be persuaded by people that we like and people that we want to be like. Makes sense. If I want to persuade somebody to do something, I got to get them to like me, right? But in certain situations, it's not about getting the person to like you. It's about smacking them with the truth and the harsh reality of the decisions that they're making and how those decisions are impacting their lives. I'll give you another example. I got a friend, he's got a lot of money. He's got a lot of power. He surrounds himself with a lot of yes people. People that tell him, yeah, man, that's a good idea. Oh man, you're really smart. Oh uh, man, you really figured that one out. Yes, 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 yes. But the guy's in a toxic relationship, toxic, toxic relationship with a girl that he should not be with who's using him, who's draining him for every red cent that he has, but everybody around him is afraid to tell him that because they're afraid that if, he offend, if they offend him or if they give him the advice and he stays with her anyway, that he's going to know that they don't like his girlfriend. But in reality, what he needs in order to persuade him to make the right decision to leave that girl is to get smacked with the cold, hard reality that he's getting suckered every single day, that he's getting used, that he's getting his money taken away from him, that he's getting his manhood destroyed. Sometimes that's the way you got to talk to people. Now, I'm not saying if you're selling gym memberships like I was for many years, that when somebody sits down, you tell them that they're completely fat and out of shape and that's why they should join the gym. However, if you discover in their needs analysis in the beginning of the presentation where you ask them a bunch of questions about why they're interested in joining and you find that the weight is a problem for them, you're gonna have to remind them of why they came into the place in the first place. So sometimes people gotta be persuaded the hard way. Always try the easy way first if you think it's the right course of action, but sometimes people gotta be nudged, sometimes they gotta be pushed, sometimes they gotta be slapped with reality. Lesson number seven is that often what you think persuades people doesn't. So this goes back to an NLP presupposition that I talk about all the time, which is that the map is not the territory. So if you were looking at New York City on a GPS map, it would look drastically different than what New York City is gonna look like when you actually get there, right? You get there, you're gonna see buildings, skyscrapers, traffic, traffic lights, cops, cabs, crowds of people. But on the GPS, all you see is a digital location. It looks different than the actual territory. Well, people do the same thing with their mental representations of the world. We don't all see the world the same way, you know? This computer, if I put it in a room full of 20 people, they're going to look at it. They're all going to see something slightly different. And I mean, that's objective. It's a computer. So think about all the subjective things in the world. Think about people's feelings. Think about people's opinions. Now think about how twisted that stuff gets when you bring mental maps into the world. And so we all have these different mental maps that we use to make a visual representation of the world as we see it. The problem that I see is that most people who suck at persuasion are too busy trying to persuade people to do what they want them to do based on their mental map of the world instead of trying to figure out what the other person's mental map of the world is and then structuring their pitch, presentation, whatever you want to call it, around that person's mental map of the world. Lesson number eight, competence leads to confidence. And all that simply means is that 
if you are trying to persuade somebody to do something, you got to know as much about that particular situation or topic as possible. Okay. For two reasons. Reason number one is that persuasion involves change. If it didn't involve change, you wouldn't have to persuade the person. They would just say, yes, change involves fear and fear involves resistance. So simply put, most of the time when you persuade somebody, you're going to deal with resistance. And from that resistance, it can take form in many ways. One of the ways that it can take form is by challenging you or questioning you as to why they should listen to you, believe you, or do what you're asking them to do. And you're going to have to be able to answer those questions. If you can't answer those questions, you're going to reinforce that person's resistance. You're going to reinforce their decision to say no to you. The more you know about the topic, the more confident you're going to be about demonstrating what you know and getting them to say yes. And the more trustworthy and credible you're going to appear. But secondly, and I just alluded to that a second ago, but the second thing is that the more you know about a topic, the more confident you are about that topic. And so you exude a type of confidence that's invisible. It's something that you can't really put your finger on. Okay. I've been studying influence, persuasion, communication strategies for 20 years. I've written sales copy. I've written sales presentations. I've sold in one-on-one -on -one situations. I've sold in, in mass situations. It's an arena that I'm extremely comfortable in. If you asked me to talk about this Canon camera that I'm shooting this video on, I would not be nearly, I, I, I tell you the truth, I would probably be terrified to talk about it because I don't know anything about it, okay? But luckily, I'm not here on YouTube trying to talk to people about my expertise in technology. So you got to know your stuff. Number nine, you got to understand context, environment, and circumstance. Again, another thing I, I don't really hear anybody talk about. So the greatest book ever written on influence, in my opinion, is the book Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion by Dr. Robert Cialdini. In my opinion, the quintessential guide to understanding how people are influenced. Book was written over 30 years ago. It's a staple in my library. I revert back to it. I read it often. And in that book, Cialdini talks about these six weapons of persuasion that he's identified through countless case studies. He's boiled everything down to these six weapons of persuasion. Okay. I'll give you two, two of them. One is scarcity, which tells us that as something becomes less available, people tend to want it more, right? We've seen this a thousand times. The sale's about to end. The price is about to go up, right? This makes you want to get the product. Diamonds. Diamonds are rare. I've been hearing diamonds are rare since I'm a kid. Where is the shortage of diamonds? They're not going anywhere. The only reason that they are perceived as valuable is because they are positioned as rare stones. But how rare could they be when we're, they're, they're not going anywhere, right? Scarcity in action. We see this not only in business, we see it in social situations. How many times two people meet, they start digging each other, they're texting each other, they're talking on the phone all the time. Hey, how was your day? How's everything? All of a sudden, one of them slows down. One of them stops. What does the other person do? It causes the other person to speed up. They start texting more. They start calling more. What's going on? Why is this person not texting me back? Why are we not talking? Why are they not answering me? Right? That's what happens. As one person starts to become less available, the other person becomes more interested because as they become less available, they become more intriguing. Okay? So we know this. We know that scarcity works. The problem is if you don't understand context, environment, and circumstance, you could use scarcity at the wrong time. There are certain people that if you sit down in a sales presentation with them and tell them, listen, if you, if you get started today, if you buy the product today, I'll sell it to you at this price. But if, if, you, if you don't do it today, the price is going to go up. There are certain people that are going to get up and walk away from you. They're going to say, you know what, man, take that scarcity act and stick it where the sun don't shine. I'll take my chances somewhere else. That's, that's just what's going to happen. So you got to understand when to use these things. Liking, like I told you before, people are persuaded by people that they like and that they want to be like. So you got to do certain things to get them to like you. The problem is if you don't understand context, environment, and circumstance, you could be doing things that you think are getting the person to like you, but in their mind, they're looking at you like an idiot. Okay. 
So you got to understand those things. Lesson number 10 is that you're being judged every moment of every day, every single time you meet somebody, especially in the first four to seven seconds that you meet somebody. So this whole concept of don't judge a book by its cover is nonsense. Now, in, in, in the scenario of trying to give somebody a piece of advice about judging a book by its cover, like I might tell my son, you know, if you meet a girl that you like, don't judge a book by its cover, right? So if my son met a girl that he liked, but he wasn't too physically attracted to her, I might tell him, don't judge a book by its cover, right? But really what I should be saying is don't permanently judge a book by its cover because the reality is he already made the judgment when he met her. And the same thing happens for you, me, and your mother and father that gave you that advice, that told you not to judge a book by its cover. We all do it. It's, it's, it's organically wired into us to do it. It goes back to primitive times to where we as a species had to protect ourselves from threats to our resources. We would immediately look at somebody else and say, is this person a threat? And so that still happens to us subconsciously within the first four to seven seconds of meeting somebody you will subconsciously cross-reference that person with every person that you've ever met in your life and try to see if you can find a match. That's oftentimes where, when you meet somebody, you're like, oh, this person reminds me of somebody, but I can't put my finger on it. That's what's happening, okay? So you have to understand that it might not sound pretty and it might not sound morally good, but it's reality. That's what happens, especially in the street. That's what happens. People are gonna size you up the minute that they meet you. It's your job to understand that that's just the reality of the situation. And it's your job to take that person and make them go from possibly a negative judgment about you to a positive judgment about you. But if you don't understand and accept that going in, just like the other nine lessons that I just shared with you, you're going to have a very, very difficult time at persuading other people. The bonus lesson for today is that people care more about themselves most of the time, okay? So what that means is, simply put, we are a self-preserving species. Again, going back to primitive times, our number one goal in life is to survive. It's to preserve ourselves. And so that's the reason why most people are concerned with themselves most of the time. What do they tell you when you go on an airplane? If the plane's going down and the oxygen mask falls, what do they tell you to do? Put it on yourself first because you can't save your wife, your husband, or your kids, or your boyfriend or your girlfriend if you are not alive. We are a self-preserving species. And so most of the time when you're dealing with somebody, and you're trying to persuade them to do something. Remember, like I said before, persuasion involves change, change involves fear, fear involves resistance. Most of the time, what that person is wondering is, what do I stand to lose if I say yes in terms of time, money, energy, and resources? What do I stand to lose? So, if you're too concerned with you and how it benefits you, and how good you look and how good you feel about whatever it is that you're talking about, guess what? It's gonna fall on deaf ears. You gotta realize that people most of the time are selfish. The reason I say most of the time is because there are situations where people are gonna put somebody else ahead of them. But generally doesn't take place in a situation where you're trying to persuade someone to do something. So you gotta make it about them. I see these guys on Instagram shooting these videos, standing in front of Lamborghinis and mansions, they're making it about them, which is fine. But you got to take that and show the person, the customer, how they can do that, that kind of stuff. Unless you're somebody like Grant Cardone, who just has an insane amount of authority that, you know, you could just do whatever you want. You have to first make people understand how things are going to benefit them. It's not about you. It's about them. So, recap, lesson number one, most masters of persuasion are born. Lesson number two, persuasion is a skill. So if you have some sort of a foundation that you are born with, no matter how small it may be, you can build on that. Lesson number three, some people can't be persuaded. Lesson number four, some people are not worth persuading. Lesson number five, some people need to be persuaded the hard way. They need to be smacked around a little bit. 
Uh, lesson number seven, often what you think persuades people doesn't. Lesson number eight, confident, competence leads to confidence. Lesson number nine, you got to understand context, environment, circumstance. Lesson number 10, you're being judged. And the bonus lesson, people care more about themselves most of the time. Now, if you want, there's a link below here. I'll give you access to a sample edition of my new book, The Street Persuasion Playbook, where I'll, I took 10 techniques from The Street Persuasion Playbook, which has 101 techniques. I took 10 techniques from that book, and I'm giving them away absolutely free. Just click the link below. You get immediate access to it. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Leave me a comment. Give it a share or a recommendation. And as always, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on that little notification button so that you get updated when I release more videos like this.